Okay, guys, um, we're on here just now. We're going to be talking about the housing market. Um, oh, geez, I mean, Richard, we were looking at this morning. We've got, you know, this is a huge shortage in supply issues, um, not just for the uh, residential market, for, for actual sales, but it's also for the lettings market. Yeah. Um, can we take a quick look? We'll take a quick look yeah. at, um, we'll take a quick look at uh, Zoopla, yeah? Yeah. So let, let's take a look at Zoopla and we'll discuss all the, and then we'll discuss the shortage and supply. Um, now for people out there, um, I don't know if you're aware, but, but the, well, you probably are aware because you're probably making loads of offers on properties and they're getting knocked back all the time. And some people are actually getting over the line and getting their offer accepted on a property because it's, it's way over the home report value. Uh, and that's the only reason they're getting it. Well, maybe about three or four or five or six other people are losing out on that. I mean, this, are you experiencing the same thing for lettings, Richard? Uh, there's there's a lot of people missing out on lettings now. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people missing out. I mean, the demand's so high, uh, like we're about to look at just now, there is yeah. really a real shortage in supply. Uh, and a lot of people are losing out. And, and it's nothing to do with circumstance or or anything, any of these mitigating factors. It's yeah. just the fact that there purely isn't enough supply. So this time last year, um, around about the December level, there was probably around about 600 properties on the market up for sale because we had talked about the shortage in supply as well. The year yeah. before that, before lockdown, there was about 1,200 properties on the market for sale. So you know where it's gone from. It's gone from 1,200 available for sale before lockdown two years ago and mm -hmm. dropped down to 600 last December. And now, wait till you see where it is now. <laughs> 399. That's amazing. My God. I, I, well, maybe amazing isn't the word I'd be using. <laughs> it's like, it's an amazing difference. Um, but yeah, obviously it's a... Uh, maybe frightening. Yeah, that's probably a better word, yeah. Frightening is the word I'd be using because, um, you know, there's a number of things that come out of that. Give me a second. <coughs> there's a number of things that come out of that. Um, the Everest agent in Fife is selling round about, probably about 500 properties a month between them. There's only 399 on the market just now available for sale, which means if you take that in a normal course of business, um, yeah. you've got 80% available in, uh, of the month. So if you take 80% of a month, which is the 30 days uh, times 0.8, you, you've basically got stock there, which will sell within round about just over three weeks. So if everybody sits still and nobody puts their house on the market and 399 properties are bought, um, every single estate agent will be out of business before the end of the new year. <laughs> now that's frightening. That's isn't reality, it? though. I mean, if there's, no, if there's no property, there's there's nothing for us to do. Yeah, because a lot of people don't realise, um, and, and 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 let me say this: uh, a lot of people actually don't realise at all that, in terms of the estate agency business, it's not anything to do with. It's not anything to do with the price we get for a property. I mean, that's the great for the seller. It's the sellers. Yeah. That's the sellers one. But for a state agency, the lifeblood of us is the transactions. Yeah. So it's not the value of the property, it's the number of transactions coming through. So if there's no transactions coming through, then there's no money being made, therefore estate agents will begin to suffer as a result of that. Now, some people might actually say that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and a state agent suffering? Give it to them. <laughs> um, but letting agents as well, you yeah. know, I mean, <coughs> let's look at the next number. We'll pop back to that. We'll look at the actual letting side of this. Um, so we'll I pop back to the duplex again. Scary we'll number for me. Properties to rent. Um, now, how many properties are typical in the market at any one point in time, Richard? So you're at five. I mean, Probably about 100? Yeah, I was just going to say, you're, you're on the other side, 100 at least. Other side, 100. So mm -hmm. at this point in time, available to rent, Right through at five, between every single letting agent is fifty-four properties. That, that to me is a letting agent, and obviously doing lettings is a scary number yeah. because, um, and I know how much of that figure we have on the market. So I think I struggle to understand how and how many other uh, letting agents have on. They must only yeah. have. Yeah, at this point in time, how many have we got in the market? We've got about seven available for rent. Seven just now. available. Yeah. So if you take seven out of there, we're down to forty-seven properties between every single light, other and five, agent yeah. and five. Yeah. And um, now the reason that we've got only seven is because as soon as we put them on, they're filled. Yeah. But they're not. They're they're filled with. Um, might I say they're filled with the right tenants, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, take yeah, the through the vetting yeah. process. What's the vetting process like? 
yeah, I mean, obviously the vetting process through all the restrictions and things, the lockdown and how things all changed, the, the whole vetting process did get a, a lot more mm -hmm. uh, more in depth at an earlier stage than what it did before. Uh, yeah. We do a lot of pre-qualifying and things, and it's not, uh, I've had a lot of people, a lot of disgruntled people coming to me because obviously they're losing out on properties because there's not enough supply and thinking that it's a, a, a method to cherry pick and things, but it's not, it's really just to yeah. try and stream yard things so that people can uh, be moved along quicker um, and mo make the whole process quicker because there's not many people looking at the moment. Um, yeah. we, need to, we need to move as quick as we can because the, the volume of inquiries coming through for one property when it goes on the market is just astounding at the minute. So we need to do things a lot quicker. So if somebody's ready and uh, got all that information in hand at the, at the get-go, then we could, we could just be like, yeah. right, okay, run it past the landlord and, and just get things moving. It's not about cherry picking, uh, which uh, a lot of people, it's, that's a term that I've heard quite a lot recently. And, um, well, that is not you know clear. yourself, because there's, there's so many people chasing uh, rental yeah. properties. You know, that's really yeah. what comes in. Can I say a quick hello to a couple of people? Hello, James, how are you? Yeah, well, if you have any questions, I, I please guess. feel free to say something. Uh, uh, Facebook user, if you've got a chance, could you just pop on the top of this link? There should be an area, it says, about to give StreamYard permission to show who you are. We'll give you a shout out if you click on that. That then StreamYard will be able to connect with you. We'll know who you are, so we'll give you a big shout out if you can. Well, we're obviously going to give Megan Burroughs a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> you've tagged in this post. Um, but if you've got any questions, please feel free to answer them. Um, so yeah. what's driving this market? Let's talk about that. Um, what's driving yeah. the insatiable appetite for property? Um, this is actually an article I've put together for the Courier. Because the wrote to me and says, what's your views for 2022? Um, mm -hmm. And I spoke about it briefly the other day, but really it's uh, interest rates, all-time low, isn't it? Yeah. Interest rates, all-time low, um, plus the fact, the percentage. Now, you'll not remember the time when interest rates were so high that it was way back in 2008, um, and it was really about, yeah, what, 62% exactly. of your income. Yeah. So that's high warning, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Could you imagine 62% of your income is a mortgage payment? Yeah, that's crazy. Aye. Well, now it's only about 36%. Yeah, it's of yeah. So interest rates are actually driving that forward because it's so uh, it's so easy to borrow money. And, yeah, and borrowing instead, so of, easy instead of getting yeah. instead of getting the three and a half times multiplier you used to get, you're getting four and a half times multiplier in some places and in other places probably a bit more as well. So interest rates tend to be driving that market forward. Um and the percentage because remember. When you look at it, you know, I don't know if, um, you know, this is how people think. It's like, how much can I afford every month? It's not how much is this going to cost me overall, you know, the bigger picture. It's yeah. just how much can I afford every month to get this dream home? And and if it's 36% of my income to afford my dream home, jobs are good. Mm -hmm. If it's 40% of my income or it's 45% of my income, yeah, I'm okay with that. Still to get my dream home, I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. So that's how people tend to think in their psyche. Um, whereas if it goes beyond that, that's when it begins to get a problem because it becomes unmanageable. Uh, that's why the 2008 crash happened because um, interest rates um, and mortgages were about 60 or over 60% of people's incomes. Therefore, they couldn't afford to put any more towards it. Yeah. So if interest rates go up, uh, the other thing I'll not need to worry about is we're all on fixed rates. Mm -hmm. So if you're on fixed rate for five years, would you bother? Interest rates mm -hmm. have gone up. So what? So that'll be that is another one. So interest rates is a key driver to the market. Um, you know uh, how you find an interest rates are now for you, Richard, because you've got a mortgage as well. Eh? Yeah, I'm on a fixed year. I'm on a fixed five year. Yeah, I've done that right. just last year. What rate um, did you get? Out of curiosity. Uh, what am I on there? Two point. Am I two point nine? Two point eight. Yeah, right read about there. Okay. But that's good to give you certainty, isn't it? Yeah. And then for me, I think uh, everybody will be surprised about this. Yes, I do have a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why I've got a mortgage in a minute. But interest rates, um, I have, I think it's 1.69, and I'm lucky mm -hmm. enough to have an interest-only mortgage still with a Clydesdale. And it's fixed for till May next year. And mm -hmm. the reason I've got an interest-only is because I've still got it from the credit crunch. Um, and it was a... It was a like a 30-year term mortgage, but I'm allowed to change it. But they're not allowed to change it from interest only to capital repayment. 
Um, yeah. They're not allowed to do that. It's hence the reason why I've still got it. But why do I still have it? That because I can still take the money that I would otherwise pay my mortgage off, and I can invest that in property and actually make more money than the one point six nine percent I'm paying yeah. on the loan I've got just now. So it makes absolute sense. If I would be, if I was making a net return of fifteen percent, which I am, um, on my buy to let and investment property then why would I know just borrow at 2% and make the 13% differential? Um, so that's the that's the key here of uh, why I've still got to continue to do that. I talked about it last night as well, um, and the fact that maybe people, a lot of people should, cons- rich people actually just lease things. Yeah, you know, They don't tie their capital up in huge assets that are producing no income for them, and they're not, they're, they're not making money for them. So that's where a lot of people tend to lease, hence the reason why I don't actually own a car. Um, I do have a VW camper van, but that was just a. <laughs> that was years and years of I really wanted a, a VW camper van, but it's it's. A, it's a, I never went to full Buna. I just went to all oh, right. It's a 1981 T25. Yeah. If anybody wants to know, um, I think its name's Bertha <laughs> and <Herod> it <laughs> for someday. <laughs> hey, I'll keep the name for nostalgia reasons. Okay. Uh, yes. Hello, Claire. Uh, Clara, how are you? If you've got any Hello. questions, please feel free to. Ask us. Hi, Carl. Um, okay, let's look at the next one. Supply issues. Big, yep. big thing. So what's Fine. your thought Fine. on supply issues? Supply issues, I mean, what I found at the minute is that um, I've got a lot of investors looking for stuff at the minute. Um, and obviously, I'm trying to get a lot of stuff across the line. Um, I think that uh, a lot of investors who have got stuff that's ready, uh, getting ready for the market we've got a lot of problems with contractors and things to get things across the line so that's got a big effect on supply there now uh, from from my perspective and how i'm dealing with investors and things just now i feel that that's a big issue uh, i've got a lot of stuff that's in the pipeline that's been held back um by works and things as well so i think that's a big thing at the moment lost your sound jim Aye. I was on mute there, wasn't I? <laughs> I thought it was me, and then I'm like, no. I no, no. I was on mute. I was, uh, I was pouring, I was pouring myself a cup of tea. That's why I didn't want anybody to hear that. So here's James's question: uh, What are yeah. your thoughts on the Bank of England wanting to the relaxation of the rules? We've been here before, absolutely, James. Yeah, um, we've been here before. That's fine. And water will find the easiest way um, to escape. That's the classic. So if you if you allow the Bank of England to relax the rules, then they'll, they'll do it. Because yeah. they're wanting they're wanting more money supply in the system. They're wanting more people to borrow money, therefore to grow the economy over time. That's the whole point of it. But my key here is my thoughts are on this is I, I'm comfortable with it because any money I would borrow or anything I would do would be invested in income producing assets, which make me even more money. So yeah. if anything happens and there's a downturn in the market, then it doesn't affect me at all because I'm still earning money regardless. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, that's that's the key here, and I I I sailed through the credit crunch the last time because of my investment portfolios and properties as well. Um, so yeah, I, I can't I can't emphasize enough how how investment property is probably the way to go for a lot of people. It's the only asset class that actually pays you while you actually wait for it to increase in value. Um, we looked at the FTSE 100 before, um, so the FTSE 100 over the last ten years has actually produced an average income of around about 4.1 percent. Um, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a wee minute, I think, uh, because I'm sure I put it in this article, possibly. No, I didn't. Okay, so the FTSE 100 in the last 10 years produced an income of 4.1% for everybody. Now, the FTSE 100 in the last 10 years hasn't gone up that significant. 10 years ago, the FTSE 100 was probably sitting about 5.5 five or thereabouts. It's at 7,000 now. So it has increased by around about a third. But property prices in the last 10 years have gone up 46%. So what does that say? Plus the fact you're getting paid. Um, the dividend, and you're getting paid a lot more than 4.1% as well than what the dividend was or the yield on, on the FTSE 100. Yeah. Um, plus the fact the FTSE 100 is the, the 10 top companies are the major producers of, of the income of that 4.1%. So if anything happens to their income, then therefore that drops as a result as well. Let's get back to supply issues. Um, oh, see, okay, supply issues. Um we need 25,000 houses across Scotland every year, every year to keep up with demand. So is that actually getting built? 
well. Mm-hmm. It's not, no, mm-hmm. no. You know yourself, Richard. Um, there's an average around about, since 2018, has been around about 20,000 properties getting built. Um, and it's a similar picture in Fife. Uh, we simply can't build enough to keep up with demand. Yeah. Um, and, and you see that demand, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, we get a lot of pressure for that demand in the uh, lettings, uh, quite a lot. And and ever so that at the moment, because obviously there is such a low uh, supply in property, um, yeah. we have had quite a lot of pressure for people. And it's like it's the same, it's the same scenario. Like you say, we are trying to fill that void where social housing has left a gap. Um, but we're struggling to do that. It's left a month. huge gap, isn't it? Yeah. I had showed that um, graph the other day about how social housing had declined on uh, on Facebook and, yeah. and how it just, did, basically, when the Thatcher era came in, so the building of social housing stopped completely and the com- mm-hmm. the sell-off happened. And we're, we are actually paying the price of the ramifications of that decision at that time. Um, it was it was, it was was it was a great decision to put empowerment back into people's hands, but the failure to continue to build council housing was the problem here. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they put that in place, and like you say, that's good. Like, obviously, the empowerment thing and that, but they didn't think ahead, and they should have really had contingency plans to keep building other properties to then obviously um, counteract that, but they didn't, and then that's what obviously caused issues. Yeah, because we're a shortfall now. If it's yeah. an average of 20,000 a year we're building, we're a shortfall of 5,000, and yeah. that's not taking into account all the shortfall from before. Because mm-hmm. of the last 10 years, just uh, and I'll, I'm going to be nice here and say the last 10 years has been a shortfall of 5,000 every single year. Some of the years have actually only been 15,000 houses built. So there's been a shortfall of 10,000. So just say 5,000 every year for the last 10 years. There's a 50,000 shortfall. Now, the Scottish government actually says, oh, we're going to commit to building 100,000 affordable homes over the next 10 years. But 5,000 each year has gone immediately because the last 10 years we've actually less than 5,000. So you're yes. only building an extra 50,000 yeah. in real terms. But then when you think about it, if we're only building 20,000 and we're doing that every single year, then we're still 5,000 behind what we had in the first place. So it's we're only getting back to spinning wheels. Yeah, and still playing catch up, yeah. So we're, and, and it'll continue to be like that. Um, next issue, migration. Big thing, eh? Mm-hmm. Why do we need migration? Skills. Yeah. Really, that's what it comes down to. Um, the doctors, the nurses, we all know there's lack of supply. I, I can't even get an appointment from a dentist. Yeah, I was just going to say <laughs> dentist. That was what that you took the words out of my mouth, dentist. Um, so they're having to they're having to bus in skill from abroad and other countries and migration. And net migration just now is running at roundabout in, in Scotland, it's running at twenty thousand a year. And it has been for the last ten years. So net migration in Scotland is 20,000 a year for the last 10 years. So that's 200,000 extra people on the Scottish population for homes that we need 25,000 a year to build, and we're only building 20. So we've got a lack of supply. We've got an increase in demand. Most people are, I think, are you getting most people actually just wanting a house on their own? What's the average sort yeah. of unit, the average family yeah. unit or? Typically, it's two and three bedroom houses that people are looking for at the minute. That's what that's but, what they but the makeup of the the makeup of the family unit is. It actually just a professional couple? Is it? Oh is right, it, oh, sorry, you I know, think you know I, is it two well, children I, or is it? You know, what is the what's the what's the ballpark and um, the the main thing? What's the main driver and the main the main family unit you're getting? Yeah, I mean, you're you're probably looking at couples and then obviously one or two children. That's probably the the the, the most common. Uh, family units you're looking at. I mean, we do have obviously bigger family units and then obviously people on their own. Uh, but typically, yeah, couples who have just obviously young families um, or obviously with, with a couple of kids. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the, the two and three bedroom house comes into play because that, that's the perfect kind of accommodation for them. Yeah, and, and that's a popular choice for a growing yeah. population. Um, but we have, we have, it's just like what, you know, James did actually say, well, we've got a decline in population in Scotland, so we do need migration. Um, I, as a result of that, um, and we have also a declining skills in Scotland, and that's so why we need migration as well. Right. Um, and like it or lump it, we need it because we need people to do that service. Plus the fact that they contribute to the economy and they pay their taxes, yeah. and that keeps everybody going. It provides and feeds into the uh, national health system. 
and yeah. the national insurance system, which actually provides all the money and the expenditure to actually keep everything going in order to look after the elderly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so net migration. So how we're going to keep up with building for what we have in the first place. This was actually a good one. And James actually, that's um, thank goodness you actually said that, James, because it's it's true. Uh, and I was looking for that statistic. The average family unit is now 1.8 compared with the 2.4 in the 90s. Yeah. Now, what, that doesn't sound a lot, but when you take into account, when you think about this, let's look at this. Um, so 170,000 households in Fife. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but bear with me. So 170,000 households in Fife, and you had uh, 2.4, uh, 2.4, gives about 408,000 people in Fife, um, if you multiply by 2.4, and that was in the 90s. Yeah. But if you now take 170,000 households in Fife and multiply that by 1.8, that can only accommodate for 300,000 people now. So when you think about it, if we've got 400,000 people in Fife and we've got 300,000 people we can all accommodate now because only 1.8 people are actually per, per unit now, we're actually 25% more demand than we did for property in the 90s as of now in Fife. Mm -hmm. And that's just in Fife. So you can extrapolate that because really that's a, that's right across the board in Scotland. Um, so you can extrapolate that and say, we have, uh, we have actually got an excess of 25% demand in terms of what we're doing. So migration will push that up as well as the skilled workforce start migrating towards here. Um, probably the next one I would talk about, uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. Ask me why inflation would affect us, Richard. Why would inf inflation affect us? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, why would, this, why would inflation affect us, Richard? <laughs> uh, so much money has been printed and pumped into the system. Mm -hmm. since since uh, since lockdown actually and even since quant quantitative easing look at that i mean quant look what they did with quantitative easing i mean we've, we've, we've literally not even paid any of this money back we're just yeah. compounding this and but the thing is if you look at it this way on a smaller scale if i gave you an extra thousand pounds a month in your hand that's no wage rise by the way <laughs> <laughs> so don't take that he said and i've got it recorded <laughs> But if I gave you an extra thousand pounds a month, when you think about it, what would you do with it? I would probably just spend it the same. Yeah. What do you think that would do if it's the same amount of resources in the system to prices? Because you imagine if everybody it's gets that. Yeah, it's got to push everything up. Yeah, because everybody would clamour for the same goods and services at the same point in time because yeah. they've still got the same limitation. Therefore, what do you think happens in the housing market? The prices go up. Yeah, pushes up. And and that's effectively what the government's done. They've pumped so much money under quantitative easing into the monetary system. We've not actually taken it back yet. We've not actually put anything in place really to actually say, tell you what, we've got to pay all this back. So yeah. this is what's driving the market as well. So much money has been printed and pumped into the system. It's causing inflationary pressure. And while it needs to be paid a pack at, at, at some point, there's no desire from the government to actually do this just now in the short term because they're concerned about the COVID implications and about the short termism of actually increasing taxes in order to get that money back and then realising it's like, oh, my God, we've done the wrong thing. Yeah. It, it, it's, almost like you're, it's almost like you're putting a burden on somebody before they start the journey, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that does make sense. So if people have more money... They're going to spend more money. Spend they're going to put more into the system. Therefore, it's going to cause inflationary pressure because there's still a limitation in supply of goods. Final mm -hmm. one, demand for you. I've actually got another one, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and I've, I've not put it on here. I've got another one yet, yeah, definitely. Because yeah. I, didn't, I didn't give this one to the, to the courier. I kept this one for myself, number six. So I do have five. Uh, demand for yield. You get it every time, don't you? Yeah. Nobody's making any money, are they? No, I mean it's it's, it's something that uh, that I, I do have to address quite a lot, um, and uh, yields are quite an important factor, obviously, when you're dealing with uh, buy to investors and things as well. And like you say, obviously, the uh, interest rates not all have an effect. Yeah, I mean they're so low that nobody's getting yeah. a return at all. Yeah, right. low so, interest rates do have a, a big effect on it. So, so do you think that's why people are coming to you to invest in property? Yeah, and I've seen, I mean, it's good because I've got quite a lot. I've got so much 
investors that come to me um, than they did before. Um, and, and obviously these are mitigating factors are obviously the, um, the reason yeah. for that. But I mean, it's good because it's allowing me to explore avenues with them where they could start building their portfolios and obviously bring in more property to the market for the private sector and things. Um, obviously there's obstacles in the way for doing that at the minute, like I say, with getting things across the line with shortage of contractors and all the rest of it. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, as a, as a really important factor when we're dealing with investment portfolios. And, and do you think, do you think property is a short term, medium term or long term investment? Oh, definitely long term. Yeah. I okay. think if you're an investor and you're, I mean, you're looking to build a portfolio, you need to look at it as a, as a, a long term uh, prospect and the long term benefits of it. If you're just wanting something for a short term, then it's maybe not really the right thing to be looking at building yeah. a portfolio for the short term. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And um, because the short term costs in actually getting involved in property are prohibitive. Especially yeah. when you take into account stamp duty, legal fees, yeah. and all the compliance issues you have to do to get a property in the first place. But often that's why people will come to us then and say, "I tell you what, let's in, let, let's invest in the property fund." So we, we mm -hmm. have put together a property fund which we will yeah. be beginning and starting, and people will invest in that. But they will get they will get a share in that, but it won't they won't have all the prohibitive costs they have in the first place in order to overcome these hurdles in the beginning. So they can uh, they can over a over a medium term invest in there and actually get a decent return. Uh, would it surprise you if I said property prices in the last twenty years in Fife, even right across Scotland, have gone up over two hundred percent? That's quite high. I mean, it would it would and it wouldn't surprise. Could you imagine, me. Could you imagine taking a hundred thousand pounds and actually going up two hundred percent over the next yeah. twenty years? And if you look at that across your whole portfolio, what yeah. you're going to what that, what that's going to accumulate to is. Uh, it's quite a lot. Depending Even better still, portfolio, you're actually earning money every single month on it as well. Yeah. So that's not even taking into account the two hundred, the over two hundred percent that you're actually increase every single month on that money. You're making money while it actually goes up in value. Yeah. I don't know any other asset class that actually can produce that. We talked about the FTSE and what they achieve, but I don't think the FTSE is anywhere near after looking at the historical way it works and actually the returns they've been getting. So I, I can't see any other asset class that could actually produce that. No, and I think a lot of savvy people who are, are now just taking to investment and things are aware of that. And obviously they're, they're uh, starting to look at building buy to let portfolios because of that reason. Yeah. Um, obviously it's better than money in the bank. It is really. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it, it has always been as a safe haven over the long term. And the reason for that is because you can see right there, history has told us that property prices mm -hmm. have always gone up over the years. Um, yeah. I actually did a comparison recently, and I think it was 221%. And then what I'd done is I'd looked at um, I'd looked at what the inflation had gone up as well. So inflation actually went up about 177%. So overall, the net effect was actually you had increased your wealth by about 50% over that, over that time. Mm -hmm. um, that was without, in real terms, without taking um, that into account. So, yeah. in, in order to provide a hedge against your 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 in, your investments and your wealth, then it's a good hedge. I mean, a lot of people choose gold, they choose silver, um, some choose cryptocurrency. I think that's utter madness, yeah. to be honest. That's <laughs> gambling. Um, but none <laughs> of them actually pay you while you're waiting for it to go up in value, do they? No. Um, so I don't think there's any other asset class. Um, why would we invest in property? Let's be honest. Um, so why is, n why is right now the time to invest in property? Well, it's because there's a growing population in need of housing and successive governments really can't keep up with this. We've just actually demonstrated it right there. Um, rents are high um, yeah. and uh, interest rates are currently low. Um, yeah. Rents will continue to be high. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fear about the rent controls. So yeah, I think people do. On that about the rent yeah. control. Yeah, people do fear about obviously rent caps and rent control and things as well. But I mean, if you look at the local housing allowance rates at the minute, I mean, they're actually quite good. They're quite in line with what you should yeah. be achieving. They're actually quite. I think. I think they're actually quite high for what you should yeah. achieve for for properties at the moment. So even if they bring in rent control, rent caps, they're not. They're not going to come below this level. So um, what are you getting for a what we're getting in Fife for a for, just under under the rent under the under the assessors? This, so this is what the rent assessor does. So a rent assessor goes out and he looks at the whole market and he decides the average point, the midpoint, it's called, of a rent, and that is the rent is determination by the government to give people on universal credit. 
So yeah. for a for a one bedroom, where is it just now round about? Your well, your your one beds are sitting. I'm actually I'm, I'm thinking the two beds are four seven three. Your three beds are five seven three. Your one bed is three. Um, is it three eight? Some I might be wrong on the one bed actually. One um, bed's about three eighty or thereabout. I yeah. thought it was three eighty. So, I remember four, when I started, one bedrooms were two eighty. Yeah, I remember. I remember them being yeah. three. Ah, uh, yeah, a lot less. So basically, they've gone up thirty five percent since I last yeah. when I started. Um, so rents have gone up thirty five percent as a result. Um, therefore, property prices have gone up as a result. Um, interest rates are at a record low. Um, there's a recipe for a really good return. Yeah. Um, that's really what it comes down to, doesn't it? There's a lot of factors that make it a good time. Obviously, a lot of what you've just went through. Obviously, the, the key here as well is we're in full employment, aren't we? In economic terms, between mm -hmm. four and six percent is actually full employment in economic terms. Um, that means uh, there's a group of people, generation rent, that are in need of good quality rented accommodation to satisfy the needs of uh, mobility of labour, yeah, flexible choices, and a com and, and, and accommodation. But they're also they're also choosing not to buy, aren't they? No, there's a lot of people that choose not to buy, and the the quality of tenants that we have at the minute that are looking for property is amazing, mm -hmm. um, and it's really difficult when we've got such a low supply of property and we've got all these brilliant tenants looking for a property and we can't house them. We can't it's, house an, them. it's insatiable just now. Eh? Um, yeah. um, do you find do you find that people are actually renting because they can't buy, or is it mainly they're renting because they just want to rent? I mean, there, there is always people that rent because they can't or they're, they're still trying to save up for a, for a mortgage and things. But the majority of people, a lot of people rent because they want to rent. Yeah, um, but, but they, what I'm trying to get at, here's the question. What I'm trying mm -hmm. to get at is, because this is a big one for a lot of people, and, yeah. and, and me included, is I like to look at this and say, are people being forced to rent because they've got nothing to buy and because they're in a position to buy? Or do you find the majority of people are actually choosing to rent because it's a... It's a choice and it's flexible for them. I would say the majority of people rent because they choose to rent and it's their yeah. choice. And I think I think renting's quite easy for them. It takes a lot of the responsibility away for them in terms of obviously upkeep and maintenance of their property and things. They didn't have all that worry. All they need to worry about is paying their rent and that's it. Yeah. We look after everything else. Um the property, the, the, the obviously the structure of the property and things, the heating system things are all looked after by either the landlord or the managing agent. Um, and they've not got that cost. They've not got extra um, insurance costs and things as well. So, yeah, a lot of people choose to do it. Yeah, a lot of people enjoy renting property. Yeah. So, yeah, it is, it is a choice of tenure then. It's yeah. not because they've not got anything else to go to. And, and I think that needs to be pointed out because there's a, there's, there's a private landlords really become the whipping boy, don't they, for everybody. I mean, they, they get it from the government, but they get it from the other side as well. And it's almost like it's almost like people were afraid to say that they're a private landlord. Oh, definitely. I mean, I've heard that a lot recently and over the years. And people that are private landlords and things are like, God, I don't want people to know I'm a landlord because you get castigated for it. And I'm thinking you shouldn't be yeah. because, I mean, there's so many landlords out there, the majority of landlords out there that uh, should be proud of what they do and 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 how they do it and, and following things by, obviously, the rule book and, and, and following legislation and making sure they've got the property compliant and all nice for for tenants moving in and they should be proud of that and they should shout the rooftops that they do that to such a quite a high standard but because there's a stigma around private landlords they feel a wee bit fearful of being yeah um upfront about the fact that they are a landlord and i don't think that's right and they should be proud in the fact that um what would happen if the private landlord disappeared for the housing i know it would it would be it would be quite detrimental to the housing the market definitely yeah the people that couldn't afford you've just said yourself people that they, they can't afford to buy the house not because the price of the house because they they're not in a position to buy so yeah. their their choice is actually to rent as a result of that um and because the local authority can't keep up with that and um, therefore we're having to provide that and fill that void, and i say yeah. we because i am a private landlord and investor yeah. as well so and and letting agent as well you're a letting agent so we have to we have to fill that void. We have to fill that gap. Mm -hmm. And as I said there before, there's no time anywhere soon, or even in the medium term, or even in the long term, to be honest, that the, the government say we're going to build enough houses in order to keep up with this demand, because it will continue to grow as a result. We are we. Are, I mean, you know, we're saying we're a declining population, but over as a global population, I don't think we do decline. I think we'll continue no. to grow, and we'll continue to continue to accept more migration 
into our countries in order to sustain our system and support our economy. Yeah. As people add value to that. And um, so one of the reasons, uh, or two of the reasons, actually, I'll talk about the other one. I, I'll, I'll talk about the sixth <laughs> one. And I've not got it on here, and I'll pop this, I'll pop the fifth one back off. Uh, let's talk about the sixth one, which is overseas investors. Yeah. The return of the overseas investors is actually starting to come back in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing people, um, it was actually blocked out because of COVID, because they couldn't come over to invest in property in, in, in the UK or in Scotland, um, as a result, because they, they weren't able to visit. But now that's starting to return in, in, in some shape or form. Um, people are, are from abroad are now seeing the, the economy in the UK as a, as a good prospect because yeah. full employment, low interest rates, um, uh, high rents, um, good value properties and good returns. Yeah. Um, so that's why the lot of overseas investors are now looking at the UK. I had a guy in Israel actually talk to me the other day about it and says, should I be looking at Fife? And I went, you're damn right. And yeah. <laughs> it's a really yeah. good return. It's a yeah, really, really good a few, return. Um, overseas landlords coming through uh, and investors and things touching base and just obviously having discussions yeah. about obviously the market here. And like you say, uh, employment levels are great. Um, and obviously the rental prices are on the, the rise and things as well. Well, the multiplier as well, when you look at the multiplier, you're saying rentals on the rise, look at the multiplier, right? The, the multiplier I'm talking about is property prices in comparison, the average price, and you can go and, for anybody out there, then go look at themselves on Google. Um, so find out what the average salary is, okay, in Fife, and then also in Scotland, and then find out what the average salary is, um, average property price is in Fife, and also in Scotland, and in the UK as well. And when you compare it, um, the average salary in the UK compared to the average property price is round about 10 times. So it takes 10 times your salary to buy a property. In Fife, it's only round about six or six mm -hmm. and a half. There's a huge leeway for property prices to go up to even catch up with the with the UK average. Average, yeah. In terms of where it is, yeah, we're way below average. So what I'm saying is there's a realignment in property values which will happen over the next probably 10 to 20 years in terms of where it is. Um, and it's like, James says that there as well. I mean, you know, he loves Fife because it's a low entry point. Yeah. Um, and I mean a low entry point in terms of the value of the property compared to the return you can get. Yeah, um, and I mean, they're, they're still good quality properties, although they're at that lower value. Well, look at the ones I'm picking up there now in Glenrothes. Yeah. You know, picking up in Glenrothes at 90,000, 80,000 for a house. And, and it's they're like, brilliant. They're brilliant. You were they're buying, you were buying houses in Glenrothes. I was buying houses in Glenrothes at 80,000 at the credit crunch. Yeah. And they're still that price to now. So where do you think they're going to go in the next two or three years? They're going to still continue to go up. Where yeah. do you think prices are going to go once the train station arrives and leaving in 2023 to 2024? Well, definitely going to go up. Yeah, because your mobility of labour is now, it's easier access for people actually to stay in the leaving mouth area, which has got access Working to the five coastal path, to all these amenities. You're just along the road to the East Newt, you're over to St Andrews, rather than actually stay in Edinburgh. And I tell you what, I'll just commute to Edinburgh every other week um, because I don't need to go in the office anymore because I can work remotely from home now. Just exactly what we're doing now. Yeah. Classic example. So that's why property investment is probably the best asset class to now. And, and and as James says, you get more bang for your buck. That's really yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, so two other reasons I want to finish off uh, just to okay. say this, why we would want to. The compounding effect of investing in property just now will see huge gains in property prices over the next 10 to 20 years and beyond at the same time as you've built an investment vehicle that literally pays you to wait every single month with the cash it generates while the capital value still continues to increase. The final one I always say here, and you've heard me say this before, you and your children and your grandchildren will basically work until you die. That's the reality of the situation. We can't get away from that. We've been told here that pensions will not exist in years to come. The government won't provide anything. Hence the reason why they've forced everybody in a situation to invest in company pensions and made it mandatory. They yeah. are absolutely terrified in the next 30 to 40 years where the pension crisis is going to lead them because it is a crisis and it's still going on, but they hide it well. Yeah. That's why you see everything else appearing in the news when the time to when it's time to discuss pensions. Everything else <laughs> appears in the news and they just oh quick shove it aside. Um literally you work until you die. So there'll be no pensions in years to come. And if you think mandatory company pensions is going to sort you, they're not. 
And the reasons why? Well, everyone else, just as we've discussed there, is going to have the same amount of income when they retire, and it's all going to get pumped into the system at the same time. So what do you think that's going to do to inflation and prices? It's all going to go up as a result. Yeah. So literally, it will raise prices for the generations to come and, and, and afford what everyone else can as well. And when you look at it, where you're going to be at that time when you retire, with the prices going up and your pension at that value as well, you're literally where you are now. Yeah. It's just going to be the same thing. Because you're not doing anything different than what everybody else is doing. Who's it once said, I think it's John Paul Getty, observe the masses and do the exact opposite. And that's the only way you'll be rich and wealthy today. Yeah. Um, and you, that's what you need to do. You need to observe the masses and do the exact opposite. So if the masses are investing in company pensions, now I wouldn't say for one minute, do not invest in your company pension. I'm a great no, I believer. Think, I think you have to do that, yeah. But yeah. I think in addition. <laughs> I'm a great believer in investing in company pensions if you're getting the benefit of the companies adding at the same time as you getting the, the actual income tax back on it as well, especially if you're a high rate payer because you're getting a, a bigger rebate in terms of your return. And you can then reinvest that in other things. So the key here is it's about making your money work for you. That's the point of this. That's the point of this whole thing to get to this combination. It's, this is all about making your money work for you and actually not letting it sit in the bank. Cash is, you know, I've heard, you know, one of the most successful guys in the world is a billionaire in property. Cash is trash. That's really what it comes down to. The cash you've got in your pocket is doing nothing sitting in your pocket. It is literally, you can rip it up and ch chuck it away. All it does is a promissory note to say that we'll give you a, a pound value in exchange for goods for this pound or five pound that you give us. But sitting in your hand right now, it's absolutely worthless because it's deflating and in value, it's it's actually eroding in value because inflation's sitting at four point six percent. So if you had your five pound in your hand or your ten pound in your hand, make it easy, call it ten pound, <laughs> and it was sitting at four point six percent inflation or five percent inflation, make it easy again. See where I'm going with this? <laughs> Literally next year, your five, your ten pound will be worth nine pound fifty because it immediately erodes by five percent because inflation's yeah. at five percent. You'll be able to buy nine pounds fifty worth of goods next year, with with the same value, the ten pound that you've got there now. That's what happens. So the key here is to hedge against inflation, and it is actually invest in an asset class that will do that. Now, as I said, that could be gold, that could be silver. Crypto is no an option, but people will say that on here. I know that'll come later on. <laughs> but screw loose if you say crypto. To be honest. That's me. That's me obliterated all the crypto people. Yeah, <laughs> but I do. I've got to say, if anybody's got crypto in the state going in, it's like unfriend, um, or you're not getting to connect. Um, I'm no. I'm not a believer in crypto at all. It's maybe a, a pie in the sky out there, but it's too volatile for anybody to invest in. I'm a belts and braces. I understand the market in terms of property investment, and property investment is where the biggest asset return is right now at this point in time, and it will be in the next. 10 to 20 years and 30 years and 40 years and 50 years and 60 years and 70 years. You, you mark my words. You take this note in time. When is it? It's the 10th of, <laughs> the 10th of December and it's coming up for 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. in the afternoon on the 10th of December. <laughs> Jim said, and the best asset class performing income and actually capital appreciation over the long term is definitely property. It's residential mainstream property. It pays, it literally, it does pay you to wait every single time to invest an increase in value while every single month you're making a return on it. So if yeah. anybody wants to know any more about this, please feel free to contact us. Richard, you're going to finalise something and see. Yeah, I was just going to say there is so many benefits and gains to long-term property investment and there's so much great investment opportunities out there. Um, yeah. Although like, there isn't a lot of property available on the market now, but there's still, I've, I'm seeing them myself and I've been speaking to a few of my investors this morning and I will be this afternoon about properties uh, in and around Fife that um, are really good investments. Um, There's a lot of properties we actually see before they actually, they didn't even actually yeah. get to market, do the investment properties. I'm yeah. actually working on another four just now that are actually probably never going to see the light of day. They'll never see any market because we're not going to list them, but yeah. actually I'm, I'm going to make an offer on them. Um, and it's another portfolio landlord. So there's portfolio landlords out there that have properties to sell. So and I just did another four there that I've actually yeah. got an agreement on. There's another four in the pipeline, which I probably can get an agreement on. 
but it's just actually getting over the line. But if you're wanting to seriously invest in property, the sh people should really come to us and, and register with us, shouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, touch base with me. I keep in contact. I mean, I've got so many investors that I just, even just messaging back and forward now and again, here and send yeah. links to properties or, uh, or or I've got this one coming up for one of my other investors that they're maybe thinking about getting rid of. And like you see, that didn't even, didn't even make it to the market. So a lot mm -hmm. of people are going to miss that out. Uh, and, the, and the reality is, Jim, with these ones that you're referring to, is that I've probably got a lot of people that are potential good tenants. So they'll probably even make the rental market either. They'll probably just yeah. get filled. And, do you know what I mean? So. so what are we talking about tomorrow in tomorrow's show? Tomorrow's show is uh, Lettings Trends for 2022 on the Saturday show tomorrow. Oh, that's right, yeah. So we're going yeah. to be talking about that. The Landlord's Guide and Future of Buy-to-Lets, isn't it? Yep. So that's going to be tomorrow. So, uh, you know, for everybody, we're going to be talking about this tomorrow, the Lettings Trends Buy-to-Let um, tomorrow. So watch out for that, please. Um, you've got yep. a golden opportunity to, to, to capitalise on that, um, definitely. Um, so watch out for that, the Lettings Trends um, and 2022. Thank you. It's going to be a really great show. You're going to be on it. So we're yep. going to have your wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm going to be on it again so people can ask me any questions they want by to let. Remember, I've been in this for 30 years. I I retired at 30 years old, which is now, just turned 55, uh, which is now uh, 17 years ago. Yeah. So I retired actually quite lucky, you know, well, lucky. Labour under correct knowledge, that's luck for you. Eh? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> but, you know, I'm coming out with the cliches now. Um, but the reality is that is true, that, though, isn't it? So I was quite yeah. fortunate to do that. But what I do is I do teach other people to do it. And I'm actually quite happy and more than more than happy to actually share information for everybody when they ask questions on our show tomorrow and every single other week. We So we do lettings every single other week, don't we? And we do sales yeah. every single other week in between there. So yeah, 9.30 we can, we can tomorrow morning for the Fife Property Show, you can see on any of these channels, uh, tune in, guys. If you're serious about your future and you're serious about investing in something and you're making no return in the bank at all, this is the asset class you've got to seriously look at. Uh, this will set you free in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, depending on how much you want to put into this, how much effort you want to put into this, but, but it will set you free. If you want to make a wee bit about money, I'll tell you how to make a wee bit amount of money. If you want to make a medium bit amount of money, yeah, I'll tell you how to make a bit as well. If you want to make a huge amount of money and buy to let, I'll tell you how to do that as well. More than happy to share that knowledge and wealth with anybody that wants to ask that question. Um, so we'll tune in tomorrow, and I'll see you tomorrow yeah. on the Five Property Show at 9.30. Yeah, see everyone in the morning. Bye-bye for now, guys. Yeah. Bye.